welcome to your monthly update from the Covidence UK study. Uh, my name is Adrian Martineau, I'm the chief investigator of the study and I'm based at Queen Mary University of London. Well, I'm pleased to say that the team has hit the ground running in January and we have results of new analyses to share with you today. Now those of you who followed uh, these webinars will know that a major recent focus has been looking at the effects and the effectiveness of vaccination against SARS-CoV-2. And so far in these webinars, you'll, you may remember that I first presented uh, data looking at symptoms after vaccination. We then presented additional data looking at antibody responses to vaccination and the determinants of that, who gets higher and who gets low antibody responses. We're now moving on from doing the immunology work to actually using the accumulating data from the questionnaires that you're providing relating to COVID test positivity uh, in order to work out what the risk of actually getting COVID-19 is after two jabs and how that might relate to the antibody responses that we collected from you. And indeed, there's another um, string of work going on looking at the risks of COVID-19 after booster jabs. But the results I want to present to you today are from uh, the new analysis that we've done looking at risks of getting COVID-19 among people who've had two doses of COVID-19 vaccine. Now this is, I think, is a topic of uh, interest to quite a lot of people. I've had a number of emails which can be summarised by this uh, Covidence water cooler conversation. Um, I'm often asked, what are my chances of getting Covid if I've had two jabs? I've had emails from people saying I've been double jabbed. What does it matter if I work from the office instead of working from home? And a common question as well is, is there anything that I can do to reduce my risk of getting Covid even though I've been jabbed? So I hope the results of this analysis will help to answer some of these questions that I've been getting. And I should give credit here to our new statistician, Julia Vivaldi, who has uh, single-handedly crunched all this data and um, got it ready for presentation today. So thank you very much, Julia. So who's involved then in the study whose results I'm about to um, present? Well, we took data from a total of 15,804 participants who answered questionnaires at least one of at least who answered at least one questionnaire after having two uh, doses of a COVID-19 vaccine. The average age was 63 years, 71% uh, women, 29% were men and in terms of the vaccine regimen 56% uh, of people had two doses of AstraZeneca for their initial vaccine regimen and 34% had two doses of Pfizer. Less than 1% had some other regimen and because we don't have very many numbers for people who had vaccines other than AstraZeneca and Pfizer, I'm going to focus on those two jabs in the presentation today. So let's first of all address this uh, first question. What are my chances of getting COVID-19 if I've had two jabs? Well, if you're a covid UK participant and you've had two jabs, we've so far seen that 786 people out of the total of 15,777 who entered this analysis had uh, an episode of COVID after having a second vaccine dose. And that works out at pretty much 5%. However, I would highlight that although this seems quite common, the risk of getting severe disease after having two vaccines is much, much lower than we used to see in the pre-vaccination era. So just 10 people out of those 15,777 or 0.06% actually were hospitalised with COVID-19 after having two doses of vaccine. These basic stats already give us a couple of important take home messages, I think. The first is that if you're a COVID UK participant, uh, on average, overall, you have about a one in 20 risk of reporting COVID-19 after your second dose of vaccine. The second important take home message is that severe disease is very, very rare in people who've had two doses of vaccine. That's 0.06% or a risk of six in 10,000 of requiring hospitalisation for treatment of COVID-19. So now let's move on to the second uh, and third question that I'm often asked. And both of these questions really relate to risk factors for getting COVID-19 after you've had two doses of vaccine. And when we're thinking about these risk factors, we can think about them in four groups. The first group of risk factors relate to people's personal characteristics that might influence their risk 
of getting COVID-19 after vaccination. The second group of facts relate to the vaccine regimen they had, which type of vaccine they had, what time of day it was given, uh, what season of the year it was given, how far apart the two doses were. Likely someone is to have been exposed to SARS-CoV-2 after they had their second dose of vaccine. And then a fourth set of factors relates to the virus itself. We know, for example, that the Omicron strain, which has been uh, predominant in the UK since around mid-December, is more infectious than the previous Delta strain. And we know that it may evade vaccine-induced immune responses more effectively than the Delta strain. So which type of virus you're exposed to could also influence your risk of getting post-vaccination COVID-19. And so all of these individual types of risk can feed through to influence your overall risk of getting COVID-19 after vaccination. And we're gonna look at each of these in turn, but I should say before I do that, that we don't actually have um, information on viral strain from the questionnaires. This is something that's not routinely typed, it's typed in the UK in a subset of people. We will ultimately get that information through record linkage, but that's a process that can take uh, some months. So in the analysis I'm going to present to you today, we're not going to look at the effect of viral strain. Let's start off looking at how people's personal characteristics can influence their risk of what we call breakthrough disease or post-vaccination COVID-19. And I should highlight that in all the analyses which follow, these are fully adjusted for what we call confounders or um, factors which can uh, cause interference in the analysis, if you like. Uh, we adjusted for 24 such factors, uh, which are listed at the bottom of this slide. First of all, how does age influence your risk of getting post-vaccination COVID-19? Well, here we had a surprise very early on in the analysis. We saw with the analysis of antibody responses that older people tended to have slightly lower antibody responses following vaccination than younger people. We would have expected, therefore, that older people might have a slightly increased risk of getting post-vaccination disease. But what we actually found was that your risk of getting post-vaccination COVID-19 is 4% lower for every extra 10 years of age uh, that you have. Um, so this was a surprising finding. One possible explanation is that it relates to the fact that older people may uh, have less social mixing than younger people. Although against that goes the fact that we've adjusted for a large number of factors here in the analysis, which are measures of social mixing, such as going to other people's houses, going on public transport, going to the shops, etc. So it's possible that that doesn't explain it. Another explanation could be that older people may be less likely to get symptoms when they're infected with, with SARS-CoV-2. This might mean that they're less likely to present for testing uh, than somebody who's younger who might have more symptoms and will then that will precipitate having a test. When we compared risk of breakthrough disease between men and women, we saw no difference in risk. Similarly, we saw no difference in risk when we compared people of white ethnic origin versus those of Asian, black or other ethnic origin. And similarly, when we looked at people who were overweight versus those who weren't, we saw no difference in risk of breakthrough. Finally, we looked at whether having had COVID-19 before you're vaccinated can influence your risk of having COVID-19 after you're vaccinated. And we saw that this does indeed uh, influence your risk. You're 50%, 58% less likely to get COVID-19 after your second jab if you had COVID-19 beforehand. Take home messages here, I think, are that vaccination protects well in high risk groups. I think it's really notable and encouraging to see that some of the risk factors we saw for disease in the pre-vaccination era, such as being overweight or being of South Asian or black ethnic origin, are ablated or counteracted by the vaccine. In other words, the having the vaccine um, counteracts any increased risk of COVID-19 that you might have if you're overweight or if you're um, of uh, Asian or black ethnic origin. I think the second interesting uh, finding is that having had COVID-19 before you're vaccinated does reduce your chances of getting COVID-19 after you're vaccinated. Now let's move on to consider vaccine factors. And there's really just one that I want to examine today, which is the type of vaccine people had. And what we saw was that if you had two doses of Pfizer vaccine, you had a 47% lower risk 
of getting post-vaccination COVID-19 compared with if you'd had two doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine. Again, that's adjusted for uh, all 24 factors uh, in the analysis. So the bottom line here is that for the initial vaccine course, Pfizer does protect better than AstraZeneca in COVID and UK participants. What about factors influencing your risk of SARS-CoV-2 exposure? Well, there are a number of these that we collect in our questionnaires, as you know, and you'll see the value of uh, asking these questions when I present the results to you today. So first of all, we know that if you're living in a household in which there's one or more school children, your risk of getting post-vaccination COVID-19 is 42% higher. And this really fits with the idea that um, schools are uh, an environment where there's quite a lot of COVID transmission going on, particularly in the post-vaccination era, because younger school children, particularly primary school children, haven't, haven't yet routinely been vaccinated. So it may be that these children are getting infected at school and bring the infection back into the household and passing it on to others in the household. You'll remember that in the pre-vaccination analyses, indoor visits to and from another household were associated with increased risk of COVID-19. And that hasn't been uh, ablated or um, cancelled out entirely by the effect of vaccination. So we still see about a 25% higher risk per visit to another household or from another household if that visit is indoors. We also see an association between higher household occupancy and increased risk of COVID-19, an 81% higher risk specifically for people who, have an, who live in a house where there's an average of more than two people per bedroom compared to those who live in a house where there's an average of less than one person per bedroom. And again, this likely reflects um, transmission of COVID in the air within the household. Again, we showed that frontline workers were at increased risk of COVID previously. And in this analysis, interestingly, we find that being a frontline worker outside of health or social care, so for example, being a teacher or working in public transport, does associate with an increased risk of post-vaccination COVID, 28% higher. Interestingly, if you're a healthcare worker, that's no longer associated with increased risk. And we think that's probably due to the effects of personal protective equipment, uh, which is used more frequently in healthcare settings than outside healthcare, such as in schools or in public transport. And finally, and this is my new favourite variable, which uh, Julia has uh, derived for us, um, we see that the background COVID rate in your local area, as you might expect, also predicts your risk of getting post-vaccination COVID. That's about 3% higher for every extra 100 cases per 100,000 people per week in your area who have COVID. So the bottom line here is that even in vaccinated people, Exposure is a key determinant of COVID risk. And I think this finding really does justify the uh, Plan B measures that were implemented to try and control the spread of a micron and reduce pressure on the NHS uh, throughout December uh, and January. I appreciate that they are a major source of inconvenience, but nevertheless, our findings suggest that they are likely to have been effective in reducing risk of COVID transmission during this period to a certain extent. So like any research study, uh, our analysis has some strengths and some limitations as well. In terms of the strengths, we took a sample of the general population. So this isn't people who take part in a vaccine trial who tend to be a rather specialised and non-generalisable group. This is people from the general population who are answering our questionnaires and many of whom have underlying uh, medical conditions. So our results are well generalisable. Another big advantage is that we had over 15,000 people taking part in this study, thanks to your contribution. And this large sample size gives us a lot of power to detect uh, risk, uh, statistically effect, significant effects of risk factors. A third strength of the study is that because we're getting information every month from you and we're able to now analyze that uh, in, in a short order, we can get real-time results. And this means that uh, we'll very soon be able to look, for example, at uh, effects of booster jabs on risk of having had a micron over the Christmas period. Um, another advantage is that because we collect such detailed information from you at the baseline questionnaire, this allows us to adjust for an individual risk of exposure. And this can't be done with large studies, for example, from the Office of National Statistics, where they don't have such detailed information on how often people use public transport, how often they visit other people's households, etc. So it's, it's a very precise 
estimate of risk that we're able to provide. And also because we've got such uh, a, a large amount of detailed information, we can look at a very wide range of risk factors. And I've really only presented the uh, major take home findings here and we're just writing up this manuscript now. I'll be able to share the link to that with you in the next few weeks and you'll be able to see the multiplicity of risk factors that we've been able to look for in this analysis. So our study is not perfect. Um, first of all, as I mentioned at the beginning, we don't have information on which viral strain people are infected with. Uh, as I say, we hope to be able to get that information via medical record linkage in the months ahead. And secondly, uh, we had relatively few hospitalizations in this cohort. That's great news for COVID UK participants and for the UK and broader worldwide population as a whole. It means essentially that vaccines are pretty good at presenting, preventing hospitalizations. From a statistical standpoint, it just means that we have less power to look at the risk factors for getting severe breakthrough disease as opposed to mild disease, which is the primary focus of this analysis. So where are we going from here? Well, you'll remember at the beginning, I highlighted this fourth piece of the puzzle, and I hope next month to have results for you looking at what the risk factors are for getting COVID-19 after your booster jab. And then uh, in a, another analysis that's ongoing, we're linking up the results from your post-vaccine antibody test to your subsequent risk of getting COVID-19 to answer the question, is the post-vax antibody level a good predictor of protection against disease? There are a couple more analyses that are also ongoing. Um, one major interest of ours at the moment is uh, looking at uh, risk factors and characteristics of people who are getting COVID-19 more than once. And a second analysis ongoing, looking at whether air pollution can affect COVID-19. And there's a couple of extra questions in this month's questionnaire, which will feed into those analyses. So all that remains for me to say now is to thank you sincerely for all the effort you're putting into sticking with the study and answering our questionnaires with every accumulating extra month of data it's giving us extra power to investigate uh, risk factors for COVID-19, risk factors for poor vaccine response which will ultimately feed into better protection against COVID-19 in the UK population and internationally so I'm really grateful to you. Until next month, goodbye. <laughs>